So we're here with Nick Williams, um, and I guess to start off, can you, I've already stated your name, but if you want to talk about uh, where you're from, where you where you were born and grew up, and I guess uh, um, where you've lived, okay, maybe well, before coming to the museum. It's actually going to be kind of short. Um, my name is Nick Williams, as you stated, and I am a Corning native. I've spent my whole life in Corning. Uh, I came to the museum in 1973, and... That was a year after we had a little flood uh, from Hurricane Agnes in 1972. Uh, I was kind of floundering at the time, trying to decide what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And this opportunity came up to uh, take a job in the library at the museum cleaning flooded books. And that's what my first job was here, was actually disassembling books, cleaning the mud off from them, deacidifying them. And it just so happened that all of that needed to be documented. And photography was kind of a passion of mine. I did it as a hobby quite a bit. And uh, the photographer at the museum at the time was also the conservator at the museum. And as you can imagine, he was rather busy with the glass collections and wasn't able to do as much photography as he wanted to. And so, it, as, uh, as far as the paper conservation, that needed to be documented. And one day they just put a Nikon camera in my hands and said, have at it. And that's how that all began. And when he needed an assistant to help him with the glass photography, they wanted to know if I would be interested. And it just went on from there. <laughs> and so that's what I was, one of the questions I was gonna ask was how it went from working with flood recovery for library materials and the glass photography, but that certainly makes sense. Um, but growing up in Corning, did you have other connections with glass or glass making in your history? Or? Uh, yeah, actually my uh, grandfather was a glass cutter and engraver. He came here from Alsace-Lorraine in about 1898, actually, and he brought the rest of the family over in 1902. And he worked for all of all of the uh, cutting and engraving shops in Corning at one time or another. And he also, as most of those folks did, he had his own cutting shop in a barn out behind the house I grew up in. Wow. And where where was that? That was at the top of Wall Street okay. in Corning. Yeah. Top of the hill. All right. So. Um, did you do any formal photography training? No, sense? I didn't. So I didn't. All sort of uh, apprenticeship it was all type, kind of an apprenticeship type deal that, that happened. Yeah. And so over the years, how long did you spend? Were you in that assistant role, or, or how soon did you get into more primary photography? Oh golly, I was in an assistant type role probably from 1974 till about 1977, 78, mm -hmm. until I started doing primary photography. Uh, okay, and there's, there were a lot of uh, publications then, all during that time, I know, and a lot of uh, pretty major exhibitions right at that point. So who was the director when you first started? When I first started, Bob Bro was the director. He's the one that actually hired me okay. uh, for the position. All right, and then, but he was, Originally, he was not director. Did that happen with the flood? Uh, yeah, right Right before the flood, Paul Perot, who was the director at the time, uh, resigned and he took a job in Washington, and Bob Brill took over as director at that point in time. Okay. I think most people, like myself included, know him mostly as the senior or research scientist for the museum. Right, so right. I think a lot of people don't even realize he was a director even, but. Yeah, he wasn't for very long, just a couple of years. And then Tom Beekner came back from the Brooklyn Museum mm -hmm. and uh, he was director for several years. Okay. Um, so over the years, obviously the museum has changed greatly. Photography has changed greatly. Um, how do you see, or can you talk a little bit about how museum itself has changed and how that might have affected the photography for the museum or in, in the field. There aren't many specific glass photographers, really. Um, so it's not like they can have publications and just hire anybody, but how, 
I, I guess that's a leading question. But, okay. <laughs> that, that's correct. Uh, we, we have evolved tremendously in the uh, 42 years that I've been here. Uh, when I first came here, we had a permanent staff of right around 20 people, and now we're up over 150. Mm -hmm. And photographically, most of what we did was all black and white photography, especially large format, 4x5. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also did 35 millimeter slides of pretty much everything as well. But as far as large format color photography, we didn't really start doing much of that until, oh, I guess it was around 1976. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the driving forces for that was that we were going to start doing annual reports illustrating some of our major additions to the collection during those years. Okay. Um, now, of course, you started after the flood, but before the flood, there was quite a bit of photography that was done that I know was destroyed in the flood. So right. were you involved with any, well, attempted recovery of that at all or with? Uh, while I was working in the library after I first came here, I did a lot of cleaning of black and white prints that okay. had been flooded, cleaning them, restabilizing them, drying them, that kind of thing. Okay. Because yeah. there's lots of stories, of course, about all the slide what slides there were and yeah. negatives yeah. being destroyed. Um, so I guess an interesting question would just be what are have, what have been some of the more interesting projects? I mean, uh, with a staff of 20, I imagine that no one was just doing one job. So if you were right. a photographer, you were probably also very involved in exhibits and everything else. Yeah, that, that's exactly correct. Uh, we always did all of the exhibition lighting, uh, mm -hmm. at least the initial focusing of the exhibition lighting, which is kind of a unique position for this museum in that the photographers do it. And someone somewhere along the line had the uh, idea that, hey, these guys know what these objects should really look like. Why mm -hmm. don't we let them light them for the exhibitions? And that's what we have done. And we've had some challenging lighting over the years for mm -hmm. several exhibitions. I can think of uh, the Galley exhibition was probably the first one where we actually had buttons on cases that you pressed where different lighting for different pieces uh -huh. could come into play. Yeah, because uh, lighting is much more restricted for exhibition than what you have available for exactly. photography. Exactly, yeah. Right. Um, so speaking of that kind of thing, have what are some of the major changes, both in photography and in lighting, that you've seen over the years? Or well, I think, I think the, the, the biggest change, and I think it'll have the most impact, or has had the most impact, has been the switch from film to digital, obviously. Mm -hmm. But uh, prior to that, we were quite limited uh, with the types of lighting that we could do here in that uh, we, we used all hot lights or continuous light sources, whereas most photographers were using flash or strobe. Mm -hmm. And the equipment really didn't exist where we could have a large soft light uh, to photograph glass with, uh, because the lights that we would have to put inside a light box, for example, would just burn it up because of mm -hmm. the heat they generated. But fortunately, along came fireproof fabrics, and that allowed us to expand the lighting in the, that direction. Uh, there were many innovations that I tried to come up with when I started, after I started doing photography on my own, to uh, devise different ways to light the glass to make the, the, the objects look, uh, I don't want to say better, but so that you could see pretty much every aspect of an object in one image. And mm -hmm. that's not always easy to do, but in a lot of cases it is possible. Well, particularly with glass, I imagine I mean, a lot of photographers shy away from glass because... Yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah. one of the things I, I've heard for years, oh my God, it's glass, it's terrible. Uh, but, you know, my response to that has always been, if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it just takes working with the lighting and, mm -hmm. and playing with the lighting because no two objects react to the light the same way. That's true. And <laughs> even today, I'm still playing with lighting all the time. I, I learn something with each object as, as far as that goes. Now, um, I know you've also been not involved with a lot of exhibitions, not just here, but uh, 
some very major exhibitions that have even traveled the world. Can you talk about some of those? Yeah, we used to, we used to do uh, traveling exhibitions. We did loan and exchange exhibitions, and I would have to carry our objects, have to install exhibitions. Uh, I've done it in Russia. I've done it in Japan, uh, Italy. Uh, mm -hmm. It was quite interesting several times. I mean, some of the hairier things were actually stabilizing and tying uh, the chain for the cage cup up one in, in, in Rome. Uh, that, that was a little bit hair raising at the time, but it worked. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, being one of only a few object handlers that we had in the museum at the time, that fell right into one of my roles. So yeah. people had to do a lot more sort of oh, multitask. Definitely, Does. yeah. And I, I should mention at this point, my, my first boss, uh, who was also the conservator, as I had mentioned earlier, taught me how to clean glass and how to handle glass. I think mm -hmm. I worked probably with him for eight months steady before I was actually allowed to touch a piece of glass. Oh, really? Yeah, oh. yeah. Wow. So in that respect I suppose we're a little unique too that I have had kind of free license to do my own cleaning of the glass objects for the photography and using my own judgment whether it's something that I don't feel comfortable doing and mm -hmm. it's time to call in a conservator to see what they can do with it. Yeah of course now we have a much larger exhibition staff and exactly. we have a larger conservation department um, so a lot of those roles are more specialized but yeah. at the time they yeah, wouldn't have been. at the time they weren't. Yeah. yeah. What about uh, any on-location photography? Oh yeah, uh, we. I think my first experience was it was actually with some cut and engraved glass and corning, and our American curator at the time had arranged to go to someone's house and photograph some of their objects, mm. and. I said, okay. Uh, and when my boss found out about it, he said, oh, he's not ready to go out and do something like that by himself. Uh, so we both ended up going in. He was exactly right. I wasn't mm -hmm. ready. Uh, you know, I think the hardest part of the job is lighting. And when you go to someone's home, you can mm -hmm. only deal with so much of the lighting that you have to take with you. And at the time, which would have been late 70s, uh, the, the lights really that, that we had required a lot of power and mm -hmm. not everyone's <laughs> house could handle those requirements so you're limited to the number of lights that you could use to try to make an object look good and you didn't have a lot of choice you, you had to do it and I think mm -hmm. that was a good learning experience as well. Uh, we also photographed uh, a couple of different collections of Galet glass in France and Italy and mm. Switzerland. And that was quite an experience. We took our lighting with us and at the time we just took uh, converters, small converters to plug our lighting into and after blowing several lamps and they really exploded in, in France, we changed our mind the next time that we had to go to Europe and photograph something, which was a uh, large collection of reverse paintings in Bern, Switzerland. And at that time, we actually bought two step-down transformers, and we took those with us. And they, the uh, person who owned the collection had an electrician come in and wire them right to his panel box. So we had absolutely no problems at all. Those are exactly portable carry-on items. No, they, they weren't. They were large and heavy, but... Uh, mm -hmm. so it must have been quite a bit of gear you had to bring with we you. We took a lot of gear and we kept our fingers crossed that it would all show up uh, when the plane landed. And hmm. I think we ended up in Paris waiting for about an hour and a half for the last case to come through and we were getting rather concerned that it didn't make it on that flight. Mm -hmm. but, Too much. And the, the trip to Switzerland, we actually uh, had one bag that did not come through on the train to Bern and we had to pick it up the following day. It came through on a, on a later train. Wow. Um, so, of course, you've been at the museum for 42 years and a lot of people have, have come and gone, but who are some of the sort of major figures that you've worked with? You mentioned, already mentioned Dr. Brill and, and Tom Beekner. Who yeah, of course well, was the founding director. Uh, well, I, I don't think I have mentioned my, my first boss's name. That was Raymond Arrett, uh, who was the conservator and photographer at the, at the museum mm -hmm. at the time. 
Uh, Dwight Lamman was the director after Tom Buechner. He was he was a, a fantastic director, and then David Whitehouse, mm -hmm. uh, Carol White, uh, Marie McKee. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of different museum people who have, have come over the threshold and into the photo <laughs> studio over the years. And uh, it, it's been very interesting and, and presented a lot of opportunities to meet people I normally wouldn't come in contact with. So um, you mentioned lighting technology in particular, and it's interesting uh, talking about photography and keeps coming back to lighting since mm -hmm. it makes sense. Well, that's what it is. <laughs> um, you mentioned a lot of the changes for people going to flash and strobe, but you still use continuous lighting here. And what's the we do. main reason for that? Uh, the main reason, reason actually still is that you can see what you're doing with a continuous light source, mm -hmm. uh, whereas with flash or strobe you're dealing with modeling lights and we actually trigger that flash you still have a lot of light bouncing around all over the place and you can't control it as tightly mm -hmm. as you can with a continuous light source and of course the future is probably going to be LED mm -hmm. uh, right now we're still using quartz halogen uh, but I, I, we have started to use a little bit of LED but a lot of progress still to come on that yeah. front because before we can actually start focusing with it right and the exhibition lighting is, is a very similar story True. to that. True. Okay. Um, so, how about unrelated to you know specifics, maybe with your your job or things you've done over the years? What are some of just more memorable events or stories or things like oh that Lord. about the museum? <laughs> Wow. Well, I, I think some of the people that, that have come to the museum over the years to use the photo studio have been very interesting. We've had uh, National Geographic photographers a couple of times. At the time, Life magazine was here a few times. Uh, BBC has been probably three or four times. Uh, mm -hmm. Each time you manage to lose uh, something or other of your uh, equipment that you count on. For example, a photo table, they may uh, melt it a bit. Or mm -hmm. I, I remember the first time the BBC came, we were using a drafting film over a, a clear acrylic rather than a frosted acrylic. And they managed to put a bubble in a whole 100-yard roll of it by having one light too close to it. And, wow. uh, but it's it's just amazing the things that you can learn from the people that do come and use mm -hmm. the studio I don't see that happening as much recently as it, as it used to but uh, those folks were good contacts to make because you could always count on them in the future as well if you needed a little help with something mm -hmm. or a little idea they were always there to give you a little inspiration if they could do you think, is that like a museum trend, or is that more of an industry trend, or uh, is it a potentially a broadcaster or publications kind of trend of using different types of photographers? Well, or? in today's world, I, you know, just to coin a phrase, everybody's a photographer now in the, the world of digital, mm -hmm. and uh, even National Geographic has cut back on the number of photographers that they have substantially. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's a trend where uh, publications, whether they be electronic or print publications, are relying on other sources to get the majority of their images from nowadays. Okay. So rather than hiring someone to really work on a photo essay or something like that. Yeah, they would, they would go to uh, either the institution that has the objects or, mm. you know, one of the larger photo houses and rent the images or buy the images. And a lot of them are free now. So, mm -hmm. so what do you value most about what you do or what do you like most about what you do? What uh, keeps you coming back for 42 <laughs> years? <laughs> you know, I just enjoy working with the objects tremendously. Um, I love the history behind the objects. I love looking at an object, finding all the subtle nuances, uh, trying to uh, relate to the person that may have made this object a thousand, maybe two thousand years ago, mm -hmm. or maybe just two years ago. 
Uh, it, it really is a very interesting job in that respect. And just being able to work with a caliber of objects and being able to handle them and really develop uh, an intimate, if you will, relationship with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember years ago, uh, Bob Brill, when he was director, said to, I think it was one of the curators, but it may have been someone else, that you know, if you really want to know about an object, ask one of the photographers. They look at it far more critically than you do, even when you're cataloging it. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of truth to that. I would agree. So, um, from my own experience of going back to when you talk about photographers looking closely at glass, a lot of photographers who avoid glass um, seem to avoid it because of the very properties that you seem to enjoy bringing to life. Mm -hmm. Can you talk mm -hmm. about that a little bit? Or? Yeah, I, I mean, you're, you're dealing with a highly reflective subject matter, and I think that that is the problem. Uh, a lot of people are scared of reflection, scared to death of them, and the idea is is to be able to use those reflections to your advantage and to make the piece look like glass, but not overwhelm it, and mm -hmm. to using the reflections to help shape the object. Uh, it, the reflections can actually tell you a lot about the object. Uh, as far as density and, and so on, and different qualities of the glass. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing that, that people who are just starting to photograph glass are so afraid of, and, mm -hmm. and it's probably one of the hardest things to learn how to do as well is to control the reflections. Mm -hmm. uh, but the only way you can do it is to actually start playing with light and trying to understand what the light is going to do. And it's not going to do the same thing with, with two to objects that look uh, the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, you put a different shape. It may be just slightly asymmetrical compared to the other object, and it's going to change the lighting completely. And it's just learning to play with that lighting. And over the years, you develop some kind of an idea as to how you want to start. And uh, mm -hmm. most of the time, you're right. But it does take a while mm -hmm. uh, before you can get to that point. And I think. For me, the absolute last thing I'll do is put a camera in place and look through the lens of the camera. Uh, you have to learn to use your eye as the camera lens and use your eye to think the way the camera lens is going to think. And that, mm -hmm. that is very difficult. And a lot of photographers nowadays don't do that. They're just so used to having the camera up at their eye level. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's kind of sad in a way, but. Uh, it, it, it's a skill that takes quite a while to develop. Mm -hmm. So, what would you say, maybe what it was, if you can easily think of it, what would be sort of your favorite piece you've photographed, or oh. and then alternatively, what would be the one that you <laughs> hope you never see again, or <laughs> whatever, have to deal with again? Uh, let's start with uh, the second question first. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, believe it or not, some of the hardest objects to photograph uh, are, are clear pyrex. I mean, mm -hmm. they just the edges tend to disappear a lot of times uh, when they're backlit, and that, that can be an interesting challenge. Uh, there have been other difficult pieces as well. Uh, when we were dealing with film, especially in larger format, we would have to do multiple exposures of an object to get the shot how you wanted it. But by that, I mean you would have different lights on during an exposure, mm. and we would also bracket the exposures. And I remember uh, Fritz Dreisbach's Corning Pokal that he did as a Raycal commission mm -hmm. piece. Uh, I had to photograph overalls of that, as well as details uh, of the engraving, and it's engraved virtually on every surface. And each exposure, I think, was a quadruple exposure, yeah. and I think I spent three solid weeks just photographing that day after day. It would take a full day to do maybe two shots on it, or wow. three shots. Uh, as far as favorite things, uh, I think Woodall Cameo Moorish Bather's plaque was one of my mm -hmm. favorite pieces. Uh, 
in the respect that uh, I had helped photograph a couple of Woodall pieces before, and I was never happy with the way that they had come out. And Morris Bathers actually gave me the opportunity to work on my own with it and see what I could do with it. And mm -hmm. I decided I wanted to do it on black. And that presented a challenge onto its own. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up doing it on a glass shelf with black velvet under the shelf. And uh, these pieces also uh, are on a, on a blank of a different color that you can normally see, and you need to show the color of that blank as well. So I ended up putting reflector card under the object, under the shelf, to transmit just the right amount of color of the blank that I wanted to show through mm -hmm. uh, on that object. And uh, the image really came out very well, and I, I've always been very pleased with that image. Uh, I think one of the nicest things anyone ever said uh, was Stanley Weisenfeld, who actually was the uh, first photographer that the museum ever hired. And we mm -hmm. actually hired, out of, hired him from New York City and brought him up here. Uh, he said that it was the best image of a Woodhull piece that he had ever seen. Wow. And that always made me feel pretty, pretty good. Um, and conversely, that object was chosen uh, by the Google Art Project folks to do a gigapixel image of. So we actually had to recreate mm -hmm. the setup of that just this past year. And again, I think that speaks volumes to the, the quality of what that image was. So. And so when Google came on site, did they rely on you to do all the lighting and setup for it? Yeah, they, they, yeah. they realized, real, relied on us to do all of that. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we more or less had it in our heads we were going to do it anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because we knew how we wanted it to look. Mm -hmm. And I, I think after having some conversation with them before they came, they wanted it to look that way as well because mm -hmm. they were very pleased with the way that it looked. So. And you've had a chance to go on Google Art Project and, and check it out and yeah. zoom oh, yeah. into yeah, the finest detail. Yeah, it's detailer. incredible uh, yeah. how far you can zoom in and the detail that is in their image, in the gigapixel image. So. So I guess this is another related question. I mean, when you, you're retiring after 42 years, um, are you continue photography? Or <laughs> have you decided? Yeah, I'll probably continue photography. I don't know if I'll continue studio photography so much, mm -hmm. but uh, I want to start photographing some of the things that uh, I actually started to photograph. Uh, many, many years ago, which are uh, more natural things, you know, okay. nature type photography. Uh, okay. Not people. People no. are not, I think, I, I deal well with inanimate objects rather than people. Uh, okay. And uh, I guess you intend to stay in Corning, so you... At this point, yeah. Yeah. And, so Hopefully, if somebody gets in a bind, they'll give me a call and say, uh, we've got a little problem. Uh, you got any ideas how to do this? Well, I'm sure <laughs> they will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is there anything else that you could think of that you'd want to add? Or? Oh, I'm sure there is. But uh, right at the moment, I, I, I can't come up with anything. But, uh, you know, it's been a real pleasure the past 42 years. And it uh, doesn't seem like 42 years, maybe 20. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, yeah, it's incredible. You know, I, I, I'm, going, I'm going to miss the place. Yeah, I bet. Yeah.